bring that are pr pretty unique. Um, I like to serve this wine not cold. I don't serve it like a, like a white wine. I like to have it a little bit in between, you know. Uh, uh, I, I like to serve it actually like I, I would serve a Pinot Noir. So uh, because it, it tends to open up more. If it's too cold, um, it's going to be, um, it's not going to open up all of its aromas and uh, you won't get the full experience, but you do want it cool, not cold. Um, and I, you know, I, with this wine, because uh, I think if you, if you were to smell it, close your eyes, smell it and taste it, right? With your eyes closed, uh, you would be hard pressed to not place it more in the Pinot Noir family than the Pinot Gris family. I mean, uh, it, it could, it, I get reminiscence of a Finger Lake Pinot Noir when I do that. Cool. Well, um, with that, Peter, can we jump into this pairing? Because I think that this is a perfect example about how much this wine carries over into red wine characteristics with some more that, you know, with the tannic structure, earthiness, uh, some salinity, um, some herbaceousness. And so we can play around with a pairing that I would very rarely put with a straight up white, just because it's really intense. It has, it, this, this marinated cheese that you guys, I'd love you to go for those who have it to please go ahead and put it on a cracker now, because this is a marinated cheese with olive oil, garlic and black peppercorn. And let me tell you that garlic is very hard to pair with fruit with aromatic white wines because it does clash a lot with aromatic whites. And so this is a outrageous way to show you how well and how well this wine works with things that you would normally put with, um, with like a Pinot Noir. So if you guys, for those who tasted with me before, um, make sure that you do this the way we've always taught it. Taste the wine first, really move it around your mouth. You can go, you can put, swoosh it around like you would um, when you're about to do mouthwash so that you can feel the tannins in your upper lip. And then take a bite of the cheese. Make sure that you coat your tongue with the cheese. The reason why I want you to do this is what happens afterwards, because what we're literally going to do with this cheese is we're not only incorporating flavor, but we're also using the cheese textur texturally, texturally to coat your perception of acid through your your taste buds that, per, that, that taste and perceive sour and your perception of salt, saltiness, salinity, based on covering up and, and, and with a layer of fat, those taste buds as well. And so when you do that, the perception of those two structural elements decrease and then all these other hidden flavors in this wine, which as you know, there are 400 plus different flavors and aromatics. So if we decrease the structure, we get huge pops in the flavor. And so I want to, now I know how Alicia feels about this pairing because you know she she's like this is her near her new BFF. But I want you for those who are tasting this for the first time, I want you guys to tell me or tell us, and then I want Greg to pop in because he he definitely is waiting for his. I want you to tell me what does what does the wine taste like on the second sip? How does it taste different than the first sip? Anyone want to pop in? Well, then I'm going to ask Greg to take over. Greg, tell me what you first, tell me what you think of the pairing and then go into and dive into the wine and let me know what you think. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I was so happy with this wine. I corvined it again. Um, <laughs> so I always know that when I'm in a tasting and I'm corvining it a second time, it's, uh, I, I, I really like the wine. Peter, congratulations. This is a great, this is a beautiful wine. And, and I think one of the things that shocked me the most was that I think of Pinot, Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio and Blau Frankish, all the same grape, as sort of a neutral, somewhat boring, difficult to discern in a blind tasting kind of grape, um, a little bit like Albarino. And by doing what you've done with the skin fermentation, uh, it, you've, you've added so much complexity to it. The nose is racy. Uh, sort of sexy, the exact opposite of what I would normally think of as a Pinot Gris. And on the palate, this thing is so much more interesting. 
It's got great acidity, but it does have texture. I'm so glad you said that they made the analogy to Pinot Noir because that's exactly what it smelled and, and tasted like, but had its own racy edge to it that was really, really delicious. And that makes it a perfect pairing for cheese, right? The acidity and that fattiness, they just like the acidity slashes through the fattiness of that cheese. This cheese is also really, really good. I, I, I had not tried it until uh, we got together, but holy cow, that's fantastic cheese. And I'm starving because I'm training for races. <laughs> And, and the, the, the mixture of the two, I, I enjoyed the, I have to admit that I enjoyed the wine cheese pairing more on the, uh, more having the wine after the cheese because the, the fat coated my, my mouth and then the wine came and, and cleaned everything off and mixed with that garlic and that texture. It's really, really lovely. Um, I, I love this wine. I, I'm gonna fight for one of the 15 cases that appear to be remaining. I, I think it's, <laughs> And, and the, one of the reasons is I do a lot of blind tastings and no one would guess that this is a Pinot Gris. I mean, no one would guess. It is, it's so well, well constructed the way that you've done it. And to see that um, as a possibility with a grape that is normally so neutral and to bring it to this level is really amazing. How, how I've not had a Finger Lakes Pinot Gris so I don't know what the unskin fermented version is like. <laughs> this is my only reference point. What, um, what, well, what? we do happen to have here. So Peter, you don't make a Pinot Gris or Grigio, do you? On a own? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, we, make, we make three different styles. Yeah. So uh, a stainless steel fermented, the skin fermented, and then I also do a barrel ferment. Ah. Yeah, we, we tend to, we tend it's it's one of our signature well everybody's signature grape is Riesling but uh, uh, we we definitely have been uh, uh, we love we love Gris and and I I don't disagree with Greg uh, uh, Gris can can kind of follow into in, into innocuous white wine category um, but uh, it's different if it comes from a unique site and you have uh, uh, you know somebody that knows how what they want to do with it. And and uh, and I, I love working with uh, with Pinot Gris. Uh, the P our Pinot Gris regular style Pinot Gris is is very expressive, um, and us think more Alto Adige in style, right? Um, so uh, uh, you know, there's there's mineral, there's there's there's, uh, there's um, you know, kind of luscious fruit. Uh, it's very uh, cleansing. The palate is very cleansing. Uh, we we don't have a problem with acidity in the Finger Lakes. That is our that is our strength. There there are regions around the world that that wish that they didn't have to get that acid by adding you know uh, from a bag. We have that naturally. And and how we balance that acid is uh, when we uh, that's that determines the success of the finished wine. So with that, I also, Greg, would love you now to just talk a little bit about, so this style, the skin ferment style, as um, Peter has said, is an ancient style, but today you still can find uh, as a predominant style of winemaking, skin ferments uh, in Slovenia, in, uh, in uh, Friuli, uh, in, in, in North, Northeastern um, Italy, and, um, and then also back in, in the Republic of Georgia. And I know that Greg has spent a good amount of time in Slovenia. You actually did some, some work with, you know, with your medical work there for a while. And you probably had some skin ferment Slovenians I'm, of wines. I'm interested in knowing um, what you thought, you know, what, how they differ from this style, um, what you thought about, you know, in, in comparison and like, should we run out and get some, 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 <laughs> um, some orange wine, so, some from Slovenia and uh, compare it with this one? If you can, um, right, I, I once had an interaction with a Slovenian producer and I said, how do I get your wine in the United States? And he said, oh, it's easy. You get on an airplane, you fly to <laughs> Ljubljana, you buy a bunch of my wine, you fly back. Um, I would, I agree with Peter. I think this is very much an Alto Adige um, style uh, of, of wine and, and it's, but, but not exactly, right? And, and that's what's so wonderful about it is that every terroir, every land, every place, 
and the winemaker have such an influence over the style. So this is going to be, in my mind, Finger Lake style of Pinot Gris. Uh, it's been fermented, but you know, it's 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 the texture that gets added. There, there is more of an oxidative style, uh, like when you think of Grobner um, from from Italy, or you think of uh, skin fermented Malva Malvasia, which is a, another lovely grape uh, grown in Istria, which is uh, two thirds owned by Croatia and one third owned by Slovenia after the war. Um, both make uh, some skin fermented Malvasia, which is absolutely fantastic. But it's it's a lot hotter, right? In in on Istria, and it's what Peter said. You get less acid as a result of it being a lot hotter, and so you get this big, rich, rounder, slightly oxidative orange wine with great texture, but without the acid uh, or as much acid. I mean, there's some Malvasia that does have some good acid. So you've got to go <laughs> to the northern latitudes, or you've got to go to steeper slopes, or you've got to go to higher altitudes. And and when you say those things, it's Alto Adige, right? It's uh, it's steep, it's cool, it's sloped, and that's where you can get these wonderful uh, high acid wines, and you can balance the, the 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 acidity with the complexity of the skin ferment uh, or the amphora um, fermentation, which is a much more oxidative style, and it adds a richness to the wines. So uh, when I I compete a lot in blind tasting, and one of the goals always to try to figure out where this is from. And acid is a big, a big way of doing it because it means northern latitude or higher altitude. Um, and and New York would be for the for the U.S. northern, right? <laughs> northern latitude. That's why Riesling. That's why you know wines like this uh, can do so well. Uh, there's there's a lot of beautiful orange wines to explore or skin fermented wines to explore. I think. You know, with, with a warning, um, the, the best quality producers that are sort of expensive really are the best producers. Um, and and it, takes a, it takes time to learn how to make a great wine like this. Uh, and there's a lot of bad stuff out there. So uh, with some orange wines, just prepare for chemical, medicinal um, uh, smells and tastes that are off. Um, you even get them sometimes from Georgia, the home of the you know, the, the original, maybe the originator of this style of wine, but the really great producers make every bottle consistently, make every batch consistently and really control everything. It's natural, but there's a lot of science involved in getting it right. Um, natural doesn't mean you have to throw science out the window. Uh, it probably means you have to pay more attention to science. I'm not sure what you think, Peter, but but you know, it, the, it's it's much less control. It's much less controllable because you're not using um, a, a lot of modern technology at certain stages. So you've got to really know what you're doing to get it right. And the difference between really good and, and bad with natural wine is not it's not very far. And that's why, and, and and that's basically Greg's basically giving kudos to to Peter on this wine because we know that there could be. And when you come into natural wines, there's a lot of room to make bad wine. And, and so you really got to know what you're doing. And, and, and I really, you know, this is such an, a beautiful example. What I'd like to do now, before we move on to our next wine, is I would like to open up the opportunity for all of you to unmic your, uh, put on your mics. This is your chance to ask questions to the winemaker of this wine or to Greg, who's been around the world tasting many, many versions of this wine um, or anything regarding uh, this tasting um, in, uh, that, that you wanna share in terms of your feelings, your, your opinions about this taste. Please share it with us now and, and uh, let Peter and, and, and Greg know what you think. Kathy. Yes, ma'am. All right, um, what do you have to say? I was going to say that normally I am not a fan of Pinot Gris, that it's too light for my um, taste. But I was um, going to say that, I, especially after the cheese, I got the earthiness of this. And that was very impressive. Uh, I, I am impressed for sure. Was well, anybody thank you. surprised like Kathy of not, you know, just give me a raise your hand if you were surprised because you typically would never drink 
Pinot Grigio and that this was completely changed your mind on what potentially that grape can be. Oh, I, <laughs> I see Alicia sticking a hand into the screen that uh, there was a doubter beforehand. Is he converted, Alicia? Uh, yeah, so yes, absolutely. Okay, any other questions or, or comments at, at all for uh, Greg and Peter before we move on to the next wine? Well, oh, Bill, yes. What else would you serve? Uh, what kind of food would you serve with this wine besides the cheese? And oh, yes. It's, it's really that's beautiful. Where, wine. Yes, that's a great question. That's when I actually turn it over to you guys to be creative because what did you learn? You learned that this pairing is about savoriness, right? We got creaminess, we got savory, we're focusing on um, garlic, we focus on herbs, we focus on black pepper. So basically use your creativeness and think of anything that has a savory component to it that is not too heavy. Don't get into things like beef bourguignon. That would be a little bit too intense, but um, but you know, I, I would take that into like a, a beautiful, you know, I mean, I, I think Greg and Peter could agree, like if you go to go to Burgundy and do their classic, you know, country herb chicken or their country pate or something like this, it would be just like outrageous. So anything that you would think of, of savory and garlic and herbs, this is, this is a wine. Peter, Greg, do you have anything to add to that? I, you know what? Um, I think most of us, most, uh, most people uh, do what I do and that, and that's called forced pairing. And that is what are we making and what's open and uh, discover. So for tonight, I'm, I'm grilling a uh, pork tenderloin. It's a beautiful, uh, it's here. We have the hint of spring, right? Uh, so in the Finger Lakes, uh, that means, you know, we're in the, it, we're in the low sixties today, but it doesn't mean that I can't go out running in my shorts, right? And uh, and it feels like spring, and I'm and I'm turning on the grill, and so I'm doing uh, I'm doing a pork tenderloin on the grill, and uh, I would have pinot with that anyway, you know, like pinot noir. I'm 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 gonna try that tonight. That's that's what I'm doing. I, but this wine also, uh, I it, it I've had things as delicate as oysters on the half shell, and that salinity aspect <laughs> and the acid uh, really. Uh, pair well. Uh, and so, uh, it, 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 there's versatility, you know, we're going from pork to, to, uh, to raw oysters. Um, and, uh, but, but you know, I'm not the song. Oh, but you know what, just the one maker. you inspired me because you know what I, this takes me all of a sudden, you're like, this is oxidative and, and contact consistency to do take you down to Manzanilla and Fino Sherry. Right. And so let's go <laughs> into Let's yeah, let's do like let's do it to you know prosciutto and um and olives and almonds and Greg's excited about this because now I'm excited about it because <laughs> yeah. I mean I was say, that's, take... that's that's the thing is pr uh, prosciutto and 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 olives added to this. Uh, also, I was thinking gricia, which is a uh, ancient Roman pasta with uh, uh, like a pancetta that's fried or bacon. Uh, in the in the pasta, there's actually a little bacony note that I got on uh, on the palate with this, and I think also its acidity and the salinity, like you were saying, would go really good, really well with um, with uh, cured porks. I was thinking yeah. pork as well. Um, that it's it, it it would be delicious, and you can imagine it cutting through any of the cheese uh, in a white pasta, uh, very, very easily. That'd be, yeah, now, now, <laughs> oh my God, now I'm getting really excited because now I'm thinking like paella with the saffron and all those notes. Okay. So guys, now you're going to go home and you're going to make all these things and you're going to pair it with Peter's wine. So any, any last questions for Peter uh, before we let him get back to his pork tenderloin, which I know he's getting excited about. I gotta, the pillow. I gotta fire the pillow. You gotta fire up the girl. A recipe for your marinade for your pork tenderloin and chat. That would be awesome. Oh. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you quickly. Uh, I made I made ceviche last night, and uh, and it was a lime and um, and uh, and tangerine uh, with olive oil, garlic, and cilantro. Wow. And the recipe I uh, was more than I did. For, for the fish, 
Uh, so I kept the marinade and I'm marinating the pork tenderloin in that. And that's, uh, and then I'm going to uh, put that on the grill. Wow. So, yeah. so lime juice, tangerine juice, cilantro, yeah. garlic. Oil, oil. Garlic and, 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 uh, and, and actually uh, there was some, uh, some celery, some celery juice. I have a juicer, so I just put it in there. And, uh, wow. and some, uh, some onion and olive oil mixed together, salt and pepper. And uh, that's what it's marinating in. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Then, uh, Peter, Peter, take sure, a, sure. Put, put, put your skin ferment, um, take it, have a glass of skin ferment next to it too, and let us know how it is. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll do. We'll do. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. It's been, I, I mean, I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming in today. And it was a treat for all of us. And, uh, and, and cheers to this wine. 15 cases left, guys. Better grab it. Now, before you go, Peter, is a new vintage coming out? Yes. Yes. Yep. 2020. Okay. Great. Yep. And, uh, and, and I assume. 2020 vintage. Okay, great. So there's plenty more to come, and I'm sure that will be um, equally as beautiful. And, and this is an ageable wine, guys. You can take this wine, put it away. Because of its tannin, because of its skin contact, it is going to continue to develop and, and create incredible notes with time. So feel free to buy a couple so you can put one away or a couple away and, and try it over, uh, over the years. So Thank you, Peter. I appreciate it. Feel free to stay in, but we're going to move on to the next wine. Um, and and uh, and and thanks again. So, you guys ready to move on to the next wine? Okay. Well, I'm going to take that as a yes. And um, we're now going to go over to um, here. It is Damiani Lemberger and 2019. So, Damiani Wine Cellars is located on the so. By Peter, um, located on the east side of Seneca Lake. Anthony Road is on the north side of Seneca on the northwestern side. Seneca is the lake for most of the winemaking in the Finger Lakes. It's the biggest, so it has the best climate for making wines. And so the most wineries are around that lake. And, um, and then we flip over to the east side where Damiani is located is a special region of the lake called the Banana Belt. And it's called the Banana Belt because it is a mesoclimate that has literally been measured by Cornell to be anywhere between five and 15 degrees warmer than anywhere else in the Finger Lakes, which can increase the growing season on that section of the lake, east side, southeast Seneca, um, anywhere between two to four weeks. Now, I'm, t I'm telling you this because this is the area where you're going to get some of the most expressive red wines in the Finger Lakes because that extra hang time that these red grapes are getting is vitally important in our cooler climate region. And nobody has been shown of the greatness of red wines in the Finger Lakes than Damiani, who basically when they started out, um, um, Lou Damiani and Phil Davis said, we're going to make white wines because that's what we like to drink. And you know what? If no one buys it, at least we have a lot of it to drink because that's because that's what we like. And then they brought in this guy. His name is Glenn Allen because he realized they realized that they need some that they don't know how to run a business and they need someone to run this business. And so that's where Glenn came into play. And we happen to have Glenn here with us today. Hello, Mr. Allen. How are you? Doing great. Yeah, great. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the uh, your your time listening about uh, the Anthony Road Pinot uh, Gris. Absolutely, I'm I'm jealous. I have not had that. We we make our own Pinot Gris, and um, I think in general Finger Lakes expressions of whites are spectacular. So the Pinot Gris from the Finger Lakes is actually much more expressive than you would get from a average across the board across all the all the winemakers and Peter's yeah. quite gifted. Yeah, I think Greg is now challenged to even try out some of our regular Pinot Gris now to see what's coming out of the region. I mean, our cool climate just really, I mean, it, it's all about our climate and that 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 cool climate and our, so our mineral-based soils are producing such incredible acid and minerality structure in our whites that that's why people are noticing us. So before um, I turn it over to um, Glenn, a couple of things I want you to know about. We're gonna be tasting Lemberger. So um, Lemberger is 
um, a, a, the same grape as an as the grape Blau Frankisch, and Blau Frankisch is the the name of the grape in Austria where this grape is originally from. Blau Frankisch actually translate as the blue as a blue wine from Franconia, and um, and that's where the name came from. When the wine actually went, believe it or not, we're going to Slovenia again, which is very close by. The wine made its way over to Slovenia, where it's called uh, uh, um, uh, the Ket Francos. And then Germany got a hold of it from Slovenia and renamed it to be Lemberger, would actually to say that this is a wine that came from Lemberg, which is an area in Slovenia. And so that's kind of what happens in Europe is that these, these grape vines get kind of uh, traded around and replanted and they kind of take on their own brand and their own, ex and their own expression in their countries. And so the name changes. However, what happens is that when we bring it to the United States and it ends up in the Finger Lakes, Basically, the wineries here can call it whatever they want, right? They can call it Blau Frankisch, they can call it Lemberger, they can't call it Keck Francos because that the 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 um, our 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 government does not approve that as an as an ex, as an acceptable label name. But Blau Frankisch and and, and uh, Lemberger are both acceptable. So each winery is allowed to choose. So I'm going to start out, Glenn. I got to ask you. Why did you choose Lemberger over Blau Frankisch in terms of naming this wine? Look, if I can be honest, <laughs> you that's a terrible <laughs> choice. It's a terrible choice to have to make. <laughs> neither, neither name is good, but hey, you know what? We love cheese. So we went with Lemberger. Um, although the, the honest to God truth is we discovered Lemberger in 2006 when we purchased grapes from a farmer who at the time could not find a buyer for Lemberger. And he said, the only way you're gonna get our Cabernet Franc grapes is if you take my darn Lemberger as well, which we did. We had never been exposed to it before, fell in love immediately. Um, he sold it to us as Lemberger. We've kept the name and never looked back. Uh, so Lemberger has been in our portfolio now, 14 years. It is, one of our darlings and um, yeah, so not well known. I'm so glad you chose this, Laura, cause I like turning people on to a new varietal. I'd be curious how many people have ever had Limburger or Blau Frankisch. A hands up for anyone who's had this grape before. Well, again, a number of them had them with me. So that was their first exposure. Well, well your groupies for sure will know it. <laughs> But prior to like, you know, the world of the virtual world of experience of Finger Lakes, probably less. Um, but uh, this kit, this, this, this whole series is about showcasing what the Finger Lakes is getting into and our potential for these other grape varieties beyond uh, Riesling and Cabernet Franc. So um, that's why we, and I, and I wanted to show Greg, Greg specifically some of these directions that we're going. So that's why I chose these specific wines to feature tonight. Well, we're excited to have it in our portfolio and um, in around the 2006 timeframe, just to give you context for Lemberger at Damiani. As you already have said, and as you know, we, we are well known for our red wines. We focus mostly in the Bordeaux grapes and Pinot Noir. You know, again, we, we make what we like to drink. Um, so Lemberger came into our consciousness and we then set out to find a, a good source because we did not grow it at the time. And lo and behold, we became friends with Bob and Kathy Ruiz of Sunrise Hill, which is uh, actually the version I'm drinking tonight. This is the Lemberger from Sunrise Hill Vineyard. It's a single vineyard. Uh, one of our single vineyard designate wines. It's fantastic. It's, it's um, something that we wish we could make more of. And over the years, we tried to get Bob and Kathy to grow more. They just can't. So we started planting it ourselves. And now what you have is our classic Lemberger. This is a blend actually of three different vineyards. 
each brings its own complexity to this. Super excited by Limburger in general because it is year in and year out with all of the vintage variation we get here in the Finger Lakes. This is by far the most exciting and reliable grape that we grow. It's relatively um, tough in the vineyard. It can handle the cold weather. It ripens well, uh, responds well to our uh, fruit thinning. Uh, if you've ever never seen a Limburger bunch, it's worth seeing. It is very large. The grapes are very large. The bunches are very large. And in fact, in, in Sunrise Hill, they call it the king of the vineyard, and rightly so. It's, it's, a, it's a big, magnificent bunch. I think it has a lot of potential here in Finger Lakes because frankly, um, it's, so, so, you, so ultimately we wouldn't be excited if it wasn't good tasting. It is. So let's, let's take a minute and, and just let's enjoy the wine and I'll, I'll chime in some more. So Glenn, nice product placement of the Corvin. I really like that. That was good. Oh yeah, total coincidence. So, old school, <laughs> thank you very much. I, mean, that I, is... I get a question for him in a little bit about that, but after we go through our tasting, but That's I want to say- this is, this is actually one of the few times at home that I use a Corvin when I know I'm not gonna finish the bottle. Usually at my house, if the bottle's open, it's empty. Yep. But I know tonight I'm not going to be able to go through all this, so I'm coraventing it. And I'll tell you more about our use at the winery later, but exactly. well, back to the wine. What so, do you guys think? What are we getting, Glenn? When you, when, what, are, what would you be describing this wine? I'll get you. Know well, so <laughs> the thing that I love so much about Limburger is it always presents tremendous aromatics. It's light in its presentation. It's uh, what do you call it? It's the red fruits, the light esoteric fruit like pomegranate. You can't get a more interesting but light flavor like pomegranate from any other wine. I, I, I get that intensely with this. Um, some uh, of the dark berries, uh, light berries, dark, dark berries. It's in the berry, it's bright, it's bright. It's not a heavy wine and it's medium bodied typically. This one's actually got some pretty good structure coming out of the 19 vintage. 19 was a tannic year. And one of the classic um, components of Lemberger that I found in the Finger Lakes is beautiful spice notes, particularly your black pepper is coming through um, really nicely. And always, every time, it doesn't matter where I'm getting La Francish, a Lemberger in the Finger Lakes, it seems to be pulling forth our, our terroir is pulling forth beautiful black pepper notes. And so a lot of people are comparing it to kind of like, oh yeah, you know, this is kind of comparable to our Syrah here in the Finger Lakes, but definitely um, more red fruit driven and cherry and raspberry um, with touches like, and the pomegranate, but also some touches of really nice black fruit. And we'll talk a little bit about even a little touch of a of, of blueberry in there in a little bit. Um, so may I, Glenn, ask Greg what, now again, now Greg, talk to, uh, tell everybody your connection to Blah Frankish slash Lemberger, because I didn't even know that this is actually a very personal grape for you. Yeah, well, I, I love it. Uh, this is delicious, by the way, Glenn. It's, it's, a, it's, it's absolutely delicious. And it shares a lot with the Blah Frankish that I'm, I'm familiar with. And I, I, you know, I, I do a lot of blind tasting, and I think I would blind taste this as a Blah Frankish. I, I, I would have guessed it was from Austria because it's really, really close uh, to that. Um, and I would agree there's a little bit more black pepper but my family is Austrian. We're, we're from Steiermark, which is uh, Graz is the capital of Steiermark. It's the southern part um, near Croatia. Um, it's, it's, it's where we make great white wines, but then Bergenland. Uh, Bergenland is closer to the Hungarian border and it's where uh, Blau Frankish I, that I'm familiar with comes from. And it is, it is such a special grape, uh, not just because my family is from there, but it's, I find that there is, there's nothing more uh, sour cherry and dark cherry as, on the palate than Blau Frankish. I, I, and, and I think you can pick it up on the nose too. 
Um, it's I've I've blind tasted uh, black fish without drinking it, just by smelling it. And it's that pepper and black cherry. And now I'm thinking pomegranate. Uh, and I'm certainly tasting a little bit of blueberry because of this pairing. Um, I had not thought of blueberry or pomegranate before, but now I'm now it's it's like a mind uh, control. <laughs> Glenn says pomegranate, and I, it's, I'm stuck with it. Right? It's a, it's in my head, and I can't get it out. Uh, but it's a it's a nice thing to be there. Uh, I find that the fruitiness, sort of the generous sour fruit of Blau Frankish, is what makes it special. Uh, it, it has some acidity, it has a little bit of tartness, but it's a, like, like eating a great cherry in the middle of the summer. Um, that's always what it reminds me of because of my, my drinking of it when I was, when I was in Austria. Um, this is a spectacular version of it. I love also the German history of um, the Finger Lakes wine. And that, that there's, you know, that it wasn't Blau Frankisch that was grown there, or sometimes is, it's Lemberger because the Germans are the ones who who came to, uh, to, to the Finger Lakes to, to grow really good wine, Riesling being the dominant form. But uh, this, is, this is really a delicious, great acidity, wonderful fruit. Um, the nose, as you were saying, is so exciting. Uh, there's so many things on it. You could sit and smell and pick out two, three, four, five things on the nose. But there's always that weird combination of black pepper and, and cherry. Yeah, it uh, comes off of uh, Lemberg or Blau Frankish. I, I love this wine; it's delicious. And so when I chose what to pair with this, um, uh, it's I, I went for basically I wanted to go for something that really showcased fruit because just so you know, this wine can pair with a lot, go a lot of different directions with the pairings because of its complexity and structure and spice. You can go again with a lot, like a lot of pork dishes, a lot of um, uh, things that have pepper notes and savory in there. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to really show you this hidden layer of some deep fruit concentration that is that that can be um, discovered again when we add some creamy cheese. It's gonna take away a little bit of that perceived acidity and you're gonna uncover a little bit more of this blueberry flavor, which comes as a nice surprise. So again, sip, bite, chew, and that second sip, you're gonna really get that blueberry coming out of the wine after you've eaten the cheese. The nose is really great. Wow. Mm. Is anyone getting that nice little blueberry flavor being transferred right through the wine into the, the end finish? <laughs> Peter, Peter and Eric are they're dancing over there at Delicia's house. <laughs> um, and and the, the cool thing about this pairing is I just found swallowed that 30 seconds later. I'm getting the pop of the blueberries. Anyone else getting that? It's like, it's now kind of taking over and I'm left with this really beautiful fruit in my mouth and, and also getting some of the vanilla and um, from the oak. Now, Stamriani does not use a ton of new oak on this. And, so, and they do that specifically because they want to showcase the fruit and that's great. And I think that's fantastic. But when we add some creamy cheese into this nice, and it's a mild cheese. And so it allows some of that creamy dairy flavors to be more pronounced and kind of like a blueberry yogurt kind of thing, like a, a tasty blueberry yogurt on the finish, which I really like. And um, in um, we are making more and more La Franca slash Lemberger in the Finger Lakes. And there's basically two camps of styles. There's this style, which I would call more of the fruit driven and fresh fruit style um, that is really, you know, really letting the, the, the grape um, and the Austrian style, if you will. There are also people who are taking this um, and making a more heavy style out of it, giving it more new oak, giving it more longer time on, this, on the skin's deeper um, concentration and making it more of a bigger tannic wine. Um, but as you can see by the one that I'm drinking, you can tell the style that I like. <laughs> And um, Glenn, I want to come back to you and I want to turn it back over a little bit to um, uh, Corvin because I have to tell you, I, I'll tell everybody, the first time I ever experienced Corvin in my life was at Damiani Wine Cellars. 
And I, you know, I, again, big partner of ours. We've been, we've been partners in touring for over 12 years now. And there was, I don't even know when, obviously it must've been around six years ago where I walked in and they had this device and they're like, Laura, I want you to try this reserve wine. They had a, a little place in the back that had these special wines and they'd pull out and they got this device. And I'm like, that is so cool. And, um, and that was my first exposure. And it didn't take me long to get, you know, to uh, ask my husband to get it for me as a gift, which he did. And uh, so Glenn, I want you to, to tell us the story of how did you find it so early? Because you literally probably were like version 1.0 or something. And why did you bring it into the tasting room? And where is its place today at Damiani Wine Cellar? How important is this Corvin device designed by this man right over here in your winery. Greg, thank you. This is the best device ever. And I'll tell you why. It works. This is the fourth uh, system we've used at Damiani Wine Cellars to showcase our reserve red wines. One of the nice things we do at, at Damiani Wine Cellars is pour aged wines for our customers so they can see what a beautifully aged wine tastes like. Uh, we also make reserve wines. All of these we would normally open and pour selectively. It's not something we pour all the time, but for anybody that was interested, we would uh, you know, open one of our nice wines and, and pour it. And we were searching basically for a system that would work. We had our own homemade um, argon based system. We tried a few others and nothing worked. So I, I was constantly on the prowl. And when Corvin came out, I was like, this is, this is sounds too good to be true. We tried it out. It works. So it's with us and uh, will be with us uh, for the foreseeable future because we continue to love opening these wines. For instance, the single vineyard uh, Sunrise Hill is a Corman product at our um, tasting room. The regular Limburger is for sale. It's, I think there's only 10 cases left if anybody wants it. Um, but this would be something we'd pull out from behind and Corvette. All of our single vineyard and reserve wines get that treatment. Uh, so it's been terrific. I, I can't wait to visit. And those are super kind words and thank you. I, I did not know that it was going to be used that way when I invented it but it's one of the ways that I've benefited from by visiting a vineyard and having a producer uh, pour uh, wines that they would not have otherwise opened for me because I was interested in that. I have to say that it has, made, it has made me a richer man in terms of wine and a poorer man in terms of money because it's, uh, I'm always buying a reserve wine that somebody pours for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weakness um, and a strength, I guess, because uh, I get to taste these really wonderful wines as a result. And, and, it's wonderful to see uh, Model 1000. We're terrible namers of Coravin, so we, we uh, it's just Coravin, but- Is that what this is? This is the 1000? That's the 1000, It's which yeah. of course was the first one we put out, which makes no sense. Still, still works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, that's, that's nine years old or eight years old. So, you know, that's, it's wonderful Person. to see and I'm glad to hear it being used. In, in medicine, our products are only valuable if they're used. Um, so we can only affect somebody's life if, if they, they're treated with an implant or, or a procedural device we came up with. And it's the same in, with Coravin. I'm, it's only useful if it's useful. It's, it's only useful if, if it's used. And it's great, to, it's great to know. I have not been to the Finger Lakes, so I plan on tasting through your reserve wines as soon as this pandemic and my vaccination schedule for next month gets, uh, goes through. Because uh, there's so Love many to have you. in all wine places. And New York is as close as it can be. It you is. Know. And I, I have to tell you how our, our guests um, specifically benefit from this device is that we offer these, these premium experiences and where when we go to Damiani, they're pulling out like 2000, 12, 2013 do, uh, uh, bottles of Cabernet Sauvignon that they're selling for $80 a bottle. I mean, which is 
this is the finger lakes, right? And our guests get to try that and they get to try it before they, and then of course they always buy it because it's yeah. fantastic. But, um, and so, you know, I, when we do those premiums, every single wine that they're being featured is featured that way because I mean, how else would a small winery with limited production libraries be able to do such a thing? And right with before that, you buy it, I mean, it makes enormous sense. Um, the, the, the biggest place, the highest density usage of Coravin in a wine region is Burgundy. Um, and it's because, you know, they pull a cork on one of their crazy bottles and it's 300 bucks. Yeah. Uh, to, and they, they wind up not showing you back vintages. And uh, now with Coravin, they, they are. But it's, uh, I think what, What's wonderful is that we all get to experience them. I always thought about um, wine sales as, as you know, as a as a shoe salesman who won't allow you to try the shoe on. <laughs> this is a great shoe. It's gonna be you're gonna love it. It's gonna fit perfectly, and it's gonna fit perfectly in five years. Don't put it on now. Put it on in five years. Right? It's crazy what poor wine sales people have to go through. And if you just let someone taste it, they experience how great this is how delicious this wine is. You know, Lemberger, a grape they don't know, um, in, in a region that they think of as a white wine region. And then they taste it and they're like, wow, this is really fantastic. Uh, and as soon as they taste it, that barrier to, to buying it and having it at home and, and exploring really great wines from really great regions, uh, it's, you know, it's, that's what my, my hope was, liberating the opportunity to taste everything so that you can really know what you love. And now I know I love Lemberger um, <laughs> from Finger Lakes. <laughs> now, Greg, I wanna, I wanna speak just one more point because this to me, the, the, the impact of the, you know, and, and this is not about really about me selling Corvin. This is just literally me being passionate about this because the way that it has literally it completely changed the, um, the wine industry as a result. And one of the ways that it benefits all of you and, and, and very much so me is the way that this device has affected the wine by the glass program in restaurants. And um, which to me is the most, the best thing ever because I love to try different wines when I eat, as you can imagine. I mean, I'm all about, you all know how much I'm into food pairing. So I wanna have a wine with my appetizer. I wanna do a very carefully chosen wine with my entree. And, and if I'm really happy and Alan is driving, I'm gonna bring some dessert wine into the picture. And the fact that these amazing wines from across the world and, and that goes beyond California is now available in not even fine wine, wine restaurants and just really nice restaurants is because of them being able to pour wines got a glass because of this program. And so it's just really, really cool. Um, Greg, do you have anything to add about the, the rest in terms of how restaurants have responded? Um, we're, we're blessed by the response and the creativity. I think wineries are creative in their use, pouring reserve wines. And then with wine, with uh, wine focused restaurants, they use it in a couple of different ways. One was to get rid of inventory that they couldn't sell otherwise. There was a restaurant in New York that sold a magnum of Petrus uh, by the half glass in three days. It was in Corbin. And a magnum of Petrus is, you know, I don't know, 10 grand? Yeah. Um, and he couldn't sell the bottle, but by the, everyone wanted to try a half glass. And then I think the, the other is, you know, some of these are creative people and they want you to experience these, especially in New York, right? I mean, New York City basically defined what people drank um, across the country outside of California. And, and you could see, you know, Blau Frankish and Gruner Veltliner and, and um, you know, we're, we're gonna try Separavi and, and you're, we're all these different grape varieties that people were not familiar with. Um, they're opening up to people tasting by the glass. They don't wanna commit the full amount of money for the bottle, but they're willing to try it by the glass or they're willing to let the sommelier convince them they should try it by the glass. And then the, the, the really crazy, wonderful, what, what I love to do, and I, I would, you know, if I went out to uh, Damiani and, and with Glenn, I would want to taste a vertical. I would want to see 10 different years of this wine, and I'd probably want to buy all 10 years. And so you see some restaurants that are doing crazy pairings, like a vertical of Chateau de Cam, a dessert wine with cheese as a dessert. So three decades of Chateau de Cam at Lydia in New York. Um, with cheese, it was $100, but when do you get a chance to taste three decades of Chateau Ikem, uh, and, and or all five of the first growth Bordeaux? 
uh, or New York Finger Lakes Riesling versus Austrian Riesling versus German Riesling or, or, or in, not versus, right? Because they're all, they're all different. Um, and, and to taste them all side by side and create learning experiences for the guests. I mean, I think in the end, in the winery uh, business and also in the restaurant business, we're in hospitality, right? And in, in making people's lives better. And if you have an opportunity to showcase an experience to someone they couldn't otherwise get, that's something that they'll remember. And that's what really wine is all about is memory, right? It, it's, we have this incredible factory memory and taste memory. And is there something that smells better and tastes better than wine? It's hard to find, right? And, and you wind up remembering, we'll remember this Zoom, for example. I know I will. I'll remember these wines and these people on this screen with this smell and this taste. Uh, and it's that special character of wine that I think if people can open up that was, that was my dream with Corbin. If you could open up more smells and more memories and more tastes and more experiences like this, that would be you know, positively influencing it, another person's life. So you know, that, I think wine has that link to memory so strongly uh, that it's such a, that one of the reasons why it's such a special beverage and it's been with us for whatever, 8,000 years. It's so wonderful that, you know, this man here, he not only saves lives, he improves lives, quality of life at the same time with th these different businesses. Um, I'm well, totally a fan. Life is worth living uh, because we have wine. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to Glenn and, and yeah. for this great so, wine. So before we, we I, I want to open it up again to all of you. Again, you have a owner of Damiani Wine Cellars. M m many of you are already fans of Damiani. Um, uh, you have an opportunity to ask Glenn any questions that you want. And then, uh, enter, and then also any further questions for Greg around experiences with um, his experience with this wine and Austrian Blanc Frankish. Um, please, um, now, oh, look at my husband is now interested in trying it. I'm excited. Um, so I would like to give an opportunity for you guys to open it up and ask any questions. Here's the gift to the Are we good? Uh, Leisha. So I'm in trouble for not joining this wine club too. <laughs> <laughs> I She's become so hooked on Finger Lakes wines. She's only from Rochester. She should be hooked. Yeah. The beautiful thing, I mean, uh, there are so many craft wineries here in the Finger Lakes. Each winery that you fall in love with has its own style, its own portfolio. At Damiani, many of our wines end up selling out to the club and never get released. This Sunrise Hill is one of them, um, typically disappears. And so that's one of the fun things of being in the clubs. You get access to these fun, special oh. wines. So Glenn, excuse me, the last tasting we did with Laura, we had a Cab Sauv, is that what it was, Laura, from Damiani? Cabernet Franc. Cabernet Franc. And it was the night after we had been at New York Kitchen. And it was my husband's favorite wine at New York Kitchen. And then all of a sudden it was in the tasting. So <laughs> He's clearly a good man. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Um, stay tuned. You'll see my name go by. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thrilled to hear that. Um, the ultimate experience is to have wine with your loved ones shared over a nice meal at a great restaurant or a nice home as you are. That is the ultimate. It's something I'm very much looking forward to getting back to when the pandemic's over doing our wine dinners out and about. Uh, I will say one of the best Limburger pairings I've had was at Daño's, which is a restaurant right up the road from us. And they're basically Austrian fare. Oh my God. So Greg, if you do make it to the Finger Lakes, definitely got to hit that restaurant. It's a Heracles. But we did a, we did a 2012 uh, vintage tasting with them where we paired our wines with their wine across the 2012 vintage. Lemberger, I can say, was a star of the evening. They had goulash, excellent combination. But honestly, the 12 was such a great year. Everything was fantastic. 
I don't know what my personal favorite that night was, the Lumberger or the Gewürztraminer, but uh, it was a fun night and I look forward to doing it again. So if any of you are not already on our email list, you should go to our website and sign up, at least for the email, if not the club. So. And I, I, that actually is a, a nice segue into, I have to plug this because it's one of my most favorite nights of the year. I mentioned it to Greg. So Glenn and I get together <laughs> once a year. We choose a restaurant in the Finger Lakes. We, we have them develop a prefix menu. And then we do what's called a, a basically a um, iron sommelier competition. And what happens is that it's a three course meal and we I bring international wines, he brings in Damiani wines and we go head to head each course and the people at the dinner will vote on which wine and they voted on a scale from one to five. So nobody knows who wins until the very end. And it's so much fun and we have a great time with it. And so Glenn and I are definitely getting ready to um, plan it. And Glenn, I, I got the chef already placed and, and we're gonna definitely make this happen. It's gonna, it's gonna be a, a, a special night when we all could get together again. Game on. <laughs> all right. I'll be there. I think we're tied. We're, we have a tiebreaker ahead of we us. We are. We are. We are. We dumb two, and we're one for one right now. And um, and I, I, I might have. We might have to be Daniels, Glenn. It might have to be Daniels, and then Glenn. That would be terrific. And then Greg will come. <laughs> I, that would. We'll do. And and I, I, that would be really yeah. fascinating. So That'd be fantastic. Yeah, because between you know Rieslings and you know and uh, and and Lemberger's and Balfrancish, I mean, we'll have a great time. So, G Greg, we will definitely send you an invitation for sure. <laughs> I have a question for Glenn. Glenn, sure. um, there's a group of ten of us coming up your way in about a month. Can we? We're renting a house up there for the weekend. Can a group of ten come in to your winery, or do we have to kind of split it up in pairs, or or what? Well, the um, seating is, I think the max is six at one table, okay. but we can certainly accommodate you. You should call the tasting room and let them know okay. so that we can, you know, help accommodate you. Um, we used to take reservations, but this time of year, it's not that busy typically, although the weekends now are starting to hum. Are you coming on the weekend? Yes. Yeah, definitely call ahead. Um, and we also have call ahead seating now. So it's not like a reservation, but call 15 minutes, 20 minutes before you get there. And we'll try and set set things up for you. Would love to have you. That We're basically following safe practices. Right. Um, we have three air filters in the room when the weather's too cold as it's been to open the doors for air circulation. And each of those filters can process the entire room. So we're, we're actually able to turn over the air every 15 minutes in that room. Um, and we wear a mask, all that kind of protocol, uh, sanita sanita sanitation, you know what I'm saying? So we're following best practices. And I think the governor did just uh, go to 50% occupancy for restaurants. We're in the restaurant um, category for Okay. regulations so yeah give a call so guys, look forward to seeing you, yeah, you great can, thank you yeah what you could do is actually you can contact me and we'll book it and if you want the premium i'll set you guys up with that we okay. do okay so well, i'll help I'll, i can set that whole thing up for you make sure you get i'll even i'll even get glenn there <laughs> <laughs> all right so yeah, you know, if, if, if you get me, then it'll be a discount, but if anybody else at the full price. <laughs> All right. If uh, there are no further questions, we're going to pull into our last wine. And, um, and thank you. <laughs> um, again, my, my pleasure. You know, I always love to be able to spend time with you and, mm -hmm. um, and, and whether it's virtually or in person, it's always a treasure time. And, uh, and I will Likewise. see you. Likewise. Cheers. Take care. Enjoy. Okay, bye-bye. All right. So we're going to jump into our last wine. And um, I and Greg and I are going to do this one solo. Um, we're going to be going into the world of Sopper Ravi. And um, 
Um, a, a few of you have had this wine with me before, and, uh, and, and I'm sure you were excited then, um, well, probably maybe partly the reason why you're back again. Um, but um, so Standing Stone um, uh, Vineyards is um, another Banana Belt winery on the southeast side of Seneca Lake. Um, they actually have the, this, this is the truth, they are the largest um, acreage of Saparavi in the United States they have. Um, it's only like nine acres, but it's the most in this country. And, um, and it came from basically, um, if we go all the way back to 1960s, Dr. Frank, who was the one who was able to show us that vinifera wines could be plant, vinifera grapes could be planted here in the Finger Lakes. Um, he was a, he was a viticulturist, and he was he was on a quest. His quest was to show that indeed we can grow these European grapes here. And he grew hundreds of hundreds of varieties on different uh, different kinds of rootstocks along different sections of the lake in order to test out which of the uh, which are the best grapes. And one of the grapes that he planted back all the way back then in 1960 was Saparavi. And it and then when his son took over, his son pulled out literally like 90% of his experiments because he's like, you can't run a business that way. That is basically a laboratory. It's now it's time to run a business. One of the grapes, one of the grapes that stayed is Saparavi, but it was, it was, not, um, it was not a featured wine. Uh, um, at Dr. Frank's for many, many, many years. And it was, it, it was a featured wine in another winery at, and on Cuca Lake called McGregor's. And they blended this wine with another, this, this grape, a uh, Saparavi is from, uh, the, is from uh, uh, the, uh, the Ukraine and uh, well, actually from the Republic of Georgia. And uh, Dr. Frank is from Ukraine, from the Republic of Georgia. And this, the McGregor's took this grape and another one of Dr. Frank's old cuttings and created a wine called Black Russian, okay? And that wine, he was making that wine going all the way back to 1999. He had a, a, a wine club that had a following of this particular wine that was mostly Saparavi, just a little bit blended of the, of the other uh, uh, Georgian grape. And they auctioned off one of the, the original, the original vintage, a 1999 vintage of their Black Russian, it sold for $900. So that's 1999, that happened in around 2015. That shows you the ageability of this grape. This wine is a highly ageable wine because of its structure, tons of acids, tons of tannins, and that, and lots and lots of lots of fruit. And as a result, it ages and develops astoundingly. I featured um, a um, Standing Stone 2012 Saparari for my Thanksgiving dinner. I didn't do turkey. I did prime rib encrusted with rosemary and garlic. And I did, because I have a Corvin, I did side by side for Thanksgiving. And we literally did a Pomerol side by side with a Standing Stone Saparavi. And 100% across the board, everyone thought that the 2012, and it was the same year, same vintage, the 2012 Standing Stone Saparavi blew it away in terms of showcasing off that rosemary garlic encrusted prime rib. So, um, so this wine is, is called, uh, is part of what they call the Tenturier series. So Tenturier is actually the, the class of the grapes that um, Saparavi is part of. It's a special class of grapes. There's not a lot of grapes that fit this class, but it's the grapes that have black skin, but also have red flesh. If you think about your table grapes that you go out and you buy, the, all grapes have red skin, but when you bite into them, the, the flesh is clear or yellow. That's how most grapes in the world are. All the red grapes and black grapes in the world are like that. Tenturier is an oddball. It's uh, clearly along the line, there was some kind of recessive gene that happened in there, some cross, you know, crossbreeding recessive that created a red flesh to go along with this red skin. So this is about as inky of a grape as you're gonna ever find because you got this intense black skin 
and then you got this red flesh. And you always know when a winemaker is working with Saparavi because they'll put up their arms and they'll be doing punch downs and they'll be completely stained and they'll be that way for a week because the staining is significant. So do not wear white when you drink Saparavi. That is definitely the, the moral of the story. And so basically back in 1997, Standing Stone, the previous owners of Standing Stone, Tom and, and Marty Masinski, wonderful former partners of mine, planted Saparavi. They didn't know what to, they got it from, they got it from McGregor and, and they planted it as just two rows. And they did that as an experiment. Well, what if we grew Saparavi and we used it to darken our Pinot Noir? Because it's an inky grape, right? So let's use it as a coloring agent for our Pinot. We don't need a lot because it's very dark and it did not work. And it makes complete sense that it didn't work because this is an in-your-face wine. Pinot Noir is all about finesse. They are not meant to live together. And so they, they said, nah, this is not working for us we're gonna make a standalone varietal of it. And it soon became a huge seller. They could not make enough. They started planting more. And today they're, uh, they're these largest plantings. Now, uh, Herman J. Weimer, uh, the Herman J. Weimer Winery owned by Fred Merworth and Oscar Brin bought Standing Stone around four, four or five years ago now. And they bought it for this grape. They bought it for the Saparavi plantings, again, because they see the excitement and potential of this grape here in the Finger Lakes. And, and what they did for it is now they showcase it there with this Tenturier series, which includes this wine, a rosé version of this grape, which is basically, um, it's a technique. So basically you, you, do, the, um, you, you do the press, uh, I mean, you um, macerate this grape, you draw out basically an hour later uh, what is going to become the rosé because it's so inky, it's like free run juice, right? So they pull off that, that rosé to give the color and that becomes rosé wine. And then what's left becomes their reserve Saparavi, which is the level above this one, which is a Sanye concentrated version of it. And, and what that means is if you're drawing off wine, well, juice off of skins, then there's more skin to juice ratio, right? And it concentrates the flavors and makes even a more intense wine. It's a classic wine te a technique that you see um, out there. And so, um, so they're showcasing this wine. It's beautiful, it's big, it's flavorful, and it's ageable. So let's jump into this wine together. And, um, and I am actually going to let Greg lead this discovery of this wine because um, Greg's experience, he's had, he said he experienced um, some Saparevi, I think, once. So this is going to be a fairly relatively new experience for you. And I want you to... to it is. <laughs> um, so first of all, what an extraordinary experience to drink this grape. This, you're drinking history. Um, this wine is from, this grape is from Georgia. Georgia and Iran are credited with the first intentional grape growing for wine. So, you know, eight, 4,000 years BC around, uh, they, they found evidence of um, intentional grape growing for wine and fermentation in Georgia and in Shiraz, uh, Iran. So they're, they're both credited. I think actually Georgia probably made it first. And this is, a, this is one of the oldest grape varieties that we know of, uh, as Laura was telling me before we started. Um, 9,000 years. Nine nine, yeah, it's, so beer and uh, wine have been fighting for the oldest um, alcoholic fermented beverage. Uh, I, I, tend, I tend toward the wine side, but beer has some good credible evidence back 10,000 years, which is right around when we started doing agriculture. So it's, you know, as soon as we started to grow plants intentionally, we started to rot them and, and grow alcohol or make alcohol. Um, so you're drinking history. Uh, it's such a weird grape in that this whole interior uh, thing that the, 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 the flesh of the grape is, is red as well as the skin. So you can't make a white wine from this. As you may know, the Champagne, you can get a Blanc de Noir, you can make a white wine from a red grape um, in Champagne. That's not possible with this. Uh, I think, so, I don't have enough context to know, and, and it's 
there are, I've been to Georgian wine tastings and they're really extraordinary experiences um, because they still grow and make wine, ferment wine in a very unique natural way and amphora, which they call cavity, which are really big tanks that are underground. Uh, they do fermentation and that oxygen gets through. Uh, they're really interesting experiences, but some people love them, some people don't. This is not like that. This is a New York modern style controlled fermentation of and, and, and aging of an ancient grape, which is you know sort of a US style of one of the oldest grape varieties known to man. And so it's, it, I mean, it's striking, right? It's not on the nose, it's, it's, I looked at the alcohol percentage, it's only 12 and a half percent. And I think that's one of the nice things about New York, actually, that the alcohol percentage is pretty low. I thought this was gonna be huge. I was thinking this was 14, 15% when I smelled it. And you, you get a little bit of the peppery, spicy, rosemary smell on the nose. And then when you taste it, that's the really striking thing. It is, there's that great acidity, which has been true of all the wines we've had, but there's grip, like sandpaper grip in your mouth, tannins, um, which is that ageability. Ageability, if you have tannins and you have acid, you're gonna go forever. And so this is a wine, it's striking that we're drinking it in 2019 and it's drinkable. Normally when a wine has this much tannin and this much spice, it's like a Northern Rhone wine, like a, like a Syrah from Cote or, um, and, and also, you know, I would actually say this is very similar to a Northern Rhone wine, like a Cote Rotie, which is Shiraz. But when they're really young, they're, they're so peppery, they're challenging to drink. This one is not so white peppery that it's challenging to drink, but it does have that great tannic grip. One of the things that, that we've all been experiencing is we poured these we poured these wines maybe an hour and a half ago, and they've been sitting in our glass for an hour, an hour and a half, or been open. And I would imagine that this is the kind of wine that will evolve dramatically on the nose and on the palate the longer that it sits in, in the glass. And this is the kind of wine where you might pour a glass at the end of tonight, put a plate on top of it, and then take that plate off tomorrow and taste it again and then put the plate back on top and then wait another day and then taste it again. And that'll give you a sense of how this wine is going to age over time. I think the other wines might not hold up to that, but this one with its tannic structure, its great acidity, its pepperiness, uh, the rosemary, I, just, I did try, if you haven't tried the pairing, it's shocking. All right, well, let's do that together because this literally, Greg, this was like a mind blowing experience. I actually, I had, um, I featured this pairing for a Christmas, a Christmas virtual special. It's, you know, it's like, like not Charlie Brown Christmas, but Laura Winter Fall Christmas, and where I featured um, Miss Miss Sanders in the corner here, and my two other tour guides um, were taking the show, and they got to bring in their favorite wine, and we paired them. And one of my other tour guides, Samantha, chose the Saparavi, and I had tasted this cheese, and I said, you know what? I think we should pair this cheese with this wine because I think it's going to be pretty mind blowing because of the fact that Saparavi is so complex in its spice profile. And so everyone together, wine, cheese, wine, and it is now, Greg, I guess the way I, you describe it, what, do you, what are your words to describe that pairing? So, so I ate the cheese on its own and I drank the wine on its own. And the best thing about pairing is that it brings out the best of both. So this is a very flavorful cheese and it's, it's strange. I mean, I, I like howda, but this is a Norwegian spiced howda. I have no idea what the Norwegians are doing to spice this, but <laughs> there's a rosemary, there's a clove, there's, there's a variety of different flavors in this cheese on its own, which make it interesting. Well, it's actually, it's all the C's. It's clove, cardamom, cardamom yeah. And then the special ingredient that's not a spice is coria is coriander seed. Oh yeah, yeah. And um, and it's it's really cool 
when you have the opportunity to maybe just, you can really get a little bit of that like straight coriander if you just eat a bite with just a seed in there because you can see the seeds. But um, yeah, it's, so this cheese is actually, what's really cool about this and it makes it, it, the Finger Lakes is such a small region and everyone works so cooperatively together that, that when someone has an idea, an exciting idea like this, I, it's usually not hard for me to find people who want to play with me. And so what happened is that, like I said, this is a, this, this is a cheese farm, uh, cheese makers, Jake Scuda, a small Mennonite farm in uh, upstate New York. They make this, this is a holiday cheese. This is what the Nor Norwegians do for holiday season. It, it tastes like, doesn't it taste like Christmas? I mean, it tastes like Christmas. And yep. so this is a holiday cheese. I featured it during the holidays. I called up my buddy, Larry, who's the one who sends everybody these cheese. And I said, is there a way that you can make Jake Scuda keep this cheese on just for me? <laughs> so I could feature it for another three months with this wine. And they said, yes. And that's, and so they're, they, this is not usually anything that they're making this time of year, but I, be, but because of this, they're, they're making it. And that's, that's what Finger Lakes is about, you know, is people working together. It's delicious. And, and one of the things that I noticed was, yes, all of those sea flavor or sea spelled spices came out with the tasting of the wine, but then there were new flavors that came out. I got a marzipan, Ooh. almost almond paste, thing that came out of the cheese when I was tasting it with the wine that was really lovely. Like I, I, I didn't taste it on its own and I, I only after I tasted it with the wine that I, 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 I sensed that flavor. And that's what I find is a great pairing when one accentuates the other, but then you get this additional new flavor that you did not, you were unaware was there. I'm gonna get a little geeky and, and show one last thing. This is the first wine that might need this. Um, I just poured myself a little bit more of this wine because I've run out. Uh, but side by side with that, I'm going to aerate it. And we developed an aerator at Corbin. I developed everything on an airplane to Australia. So I really need to go back to Australia so I can come up with uh, another new idea. But um, I realized that aeration is just surface area times time. So if I increase the surface area, I can increase the aeration of the wine. And so I turn this stream into 30 different streams. And those streams become droplets and the droplets increase the surface area dramatically. So I'm going to try um, aerated versus non-aerated and see what happens. That's sort of my equivalent of leaving it with the plate on top of it for a couple of days. It's the equivalent of an hour in your glass, but this wine is so interesting. Wow, yeah. Now, now Greg, I went and got my aerator. Oh, really? Oh, awesome. Okay, well, we, we, can, both, we can both try this. This is a this is actually an excuse just to drink another glass of wine. You can have one on air and one air, and uh, but it's interesting with a, with wines with tannin to see what happens to it. Mm. Yeah, brings the tannin way down, the fruit way well, up. The fruit goes way up, way yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, tannin comes down, the fruit goes up. Yeah. Which, you know, with some wines, I'm not sure I want. Um, sometimes you just love the tannin, you love that grip. And this wine has such great grip. So outside of cheese, what would you serve this with? Um, oh my gosh. Such an interesting young wine with such great acidity. Fatty meats would be I'm going, good. I'm going. Lamb. Lamb, lamb, lamb. Lamb, lamb, lamb. Yeah. lamb, lamb, lamb. Short just rib. Like cover tea, just like the Northern Rome. So yeah. Georgians love lamb shish kebabs. Mm. Now, Dasha's from Russia, so I am I'm to play yes. around with some of those uh, favorite traditional recipes of your and what would those so be? The, so Georgians have, um, so shish kebabs obviously is um, lamb shish kebab. They also have a dish called satsivi, which is like chicken with like cream, um, garlicky walnuts, which is really, really good. If I find it, I'm going to put let me google it and i'll put it in chat um but this so my wine so i actually got it at the russian store it's 2018 it is separavi it's called kahuri something something i'm gonna see this is the label 
You can't um, show Maryland where she lives. I live in I live in Rock Hill, Maryland, and we have a couple of Russian stores, so I got it. But um, let me Google this um, this garlicky chicken dish, and I'll put the link in chat so you guys can see um, while you guys are talking. Yeah, I think beef bourguignon would be amazing. Um, short ribs again, again with all that fatty meat, um, and and you know with that with that savory sauce would be so good. Um, anyone else have any other ideas of things that traditional Christmas time kind of hearty meals? I mean, this is bring out the hearty meats. I mean, that's what this is all about. I wonder how it would stand up to something like a cassoulet with the beans and the duck and the sausage. I feel like that would be really amazing. There's no question it would stand up. There's absolutely no question. I mean, it, especially with all the herbaceousness going on in there too, I would think that would be. What, what, what about, what about, what about game meat like venison or, or. Yeah. Know. Yeah, the fruity flavors in the, the fruit in this wine, I think would pair really well with venison. Um, I, I would marinate. Zero fat in venison, but the, the fruitiness of it. Yeah. I think would be, it's kind of a gamey wine. And, yeah. and that's a pretty traditional pairing of a, a Northern Rhone wine as well, cocoa tea and, and venison. Yeah, Greg, I mean, you, I think you could even do a marinade with this wine to help break down because it, you know venison doesn't have that fat, you help break down the proteins a little bit. Do a little bit of marination because certainly the acidity will help do that. And if everybody loves olives, I mean, this is a great olive wine. Um, really, any olive in a charcuterie board and this wine would be spectacular. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, any other, anyone else have any other thoughts about, um, about this, this wine? Um, or any other questions for uh, for, for Greg on, on Georgian, uh, Georgian wines in general? Uh, thank you so much for actually all your all your suggestions. I think we're all going to be jumping into doing some things, uh, some new things with this wine, and definitely age it. I mean, I definitely have at least um, three more bottles of the 2012 Saparavi from Standing Stone that will continue to develop and age. Um, and uh, and and you could also get, like I said, try out McGregor, who's been doing it for a long time. And they, they, they sell it for a hefty price because of the following that they have. Um, with that- what a great opportunity you guys all have to, I mean, with, with the incredible wines being made in the Finger Lakes, to taste Finger Lake Riesling versus Austrian Riesling versus German Riesling, to taste uh, Blau Frankisch versus Lemberger versus, you know, in Germany and Austria and, and New York again. And then, you know, this Georgian grape, uh, if you can find it, from uh, from Georgia in the United States, uh, it's it's probably available um, to be able to taste what New York is doing relative to the homeland of of this grape would be fascinating. I mean, we have such amazing winemakers in this country yeah. uh, that are, I think, traditionalists, but also kind of trying to set their own path uh, with these wines. That. I mean, I, I would have to say that the uh, Damiani is just right down the middle Austrian Blau Frankish. Um, the Pinot Gris that we had is a unique, I've never had anything like it. Uh, maybe a little bit like Alto Adige in Italy. I, just, I think it's fantastic. It's one of my, one of my wines of the night for sure. And, you know, to be able to taste an ancient Georgian grape uh, and then taste it from such a new territory for a Georgian grape. It only took 8,000 years for it to get here. Uh, <laughs> right? It's kind of a cool, what an extraordinary experience uh, and to be able to take them side by side. I'm so, I mean, this to me is, I mean, it's just such such a wonderful, special opportunity for me to, to showcase um, the specialness of, of what's going on here to you, Greg. And, um, and before we go, I, I want to ask you, um, and I, it's kind of like, a, I, I know a little bit, so I'm going to ask you to, to elaborate. What is coming down the pike with mm -hmm. Corvin? Because is there something exciting that I should know about that will make my life even better than it already is? Oh, um, so when I founded the company, I said faster, easier, more fun than opening a bottle, independent of closure. So we have the screw cap, um, still or sparkling. So uh, I'm, 
I'm 80 to 90, well, depending upon your perspective, I'm 80 to 90% of the way there, or I'm 0% of the way there. <laughs> I have friends who drink only sparkling wine, and they're like, where is the sparkling? Um, so I have been working for the last nine years on sparkling wine. And um, my dream is to be able to have a glass of sparkling any night of the week. Uh, sparkling goes bad in two ways. It, it oxidizes like normal wine, and it also goes flat. Um, so imagine if you could drink a glass of champagne or New York sparkling or California sparkling um, or the wines from Franciacorta in Italy or from Cava in Spain or Prosecco or Australia, have a glass of sparkling wine any night of the week, do a vertical of sparkling, do a horizontal of sparklings. So um, we are... This pandemic has been a curse for me in that my favorite part about wine is people and, and, and physically meeting them and going to wine territories. I get to meet, but I found there was a cure to that and that was Zoom. Um, then it has been a benefit in that it's been the most productive, inventive period. We created a product called Pivot, um, which pours from an open bottle and preserves it for a month. Soon it'll be three months, then it'll be six months, then it'll be a year. Um, but we learned so much from that and from our screw cap that we've gotten good at sparkling. And so uh, you will see the first Corbin sparkling launch in the third quarter of this year. And I'll be your beta. Yeah. I will totally be your beta. Just <laughs> because there is, to me, that's like the holy grail, you know, because it's like you open a bottle of sparkling and it's done. I mean, you have to finish it that day. You have no choice. It doesn't even, you know, you know that these wines will last you a day or two or three, but sparkling, it's, it's, you got to finish it. And so I, I, I'll be your beta. I'll try. Yeah. I'll be a tester. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, so I'll tell you the secret to the Corbin launch strategy. And that is to give it to the producers first. Um, we give, we, we use our product on somebody else's. And so we owe the respect that is deserved to the wine producers. And so uh, the first prototypes are spoken for by the many hundreds of sparkling wine producers that make incredible sparkling wines. I used to, I was, I was terrible about sparkling wine. I was classic in the sparkling wine industry. I drank it at Christmas and at New Year's. So 100% of my sparkling wine consumption was during a holiday period. Um, now, uh, and there's a prototype right there, and there are nine sparkling wines under Corbin Sparkling right over there. I drink a glass of sparkling wine every day. Totally jealous. Yeah. Totally. Kind of like, like the apple, Greg, that keeps the doctor away. That's yeah, exactly. Well, I hope so. Or else I'm going to go see the doctor. <laughs> so, Laurel, I just see so many Laurel, cocktail I, recipes that says top with a little sparkling wine. And I was like, well, I'm going to open a whole sparkling wine to top my little French 75. And we're going to do the rest of the bottle. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and, Laurel, and, and maybe it's, you know, sparkling wine is great, but maybe it's not the only type of wine you want to drink that night. So imagine being able to have a glass of sparkling and then have you know, this, this Lemberger from Damiani or have the Standing Stone um, uh, separati. I mean, th that's, my dream is to bring the restaurant experience to the home so that you can have a glass of sparkling, a glass of wine, a glass of red, a dessert wine, a night of the week. It doesn't have to be a full glass. It really doesn't matter how much it is. And then you can go to a restaurant and have the same and they'll serve you a vertical of Krug um, or you can go to the producer and they will taste you on whatever they want uh, and whatever you want. Uh, imagine that freedom where we separate the volume of, that we want to taste or drink from the volume that it's sold and have complete separation <clears throat> to enjoy what we want when we want in, in exactly the amount we want. That's, uh, I'm, I'm probably not allowed to talk about it. I see Michelle's pop on. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I was just going to let them in on another secret. So since I, I just oh, uh, yeah, yeah. sent a, a chat to this group, I said, you do a lot of these things. And what an amazing group. I love their camaraderie. And um, I will be buying more wine. <laughs> and my ex-husband was a huge Limburger fan, and I couldn't stand it. And now, wow. I mean, wow, wow, wow. I'll have to let him know. 
But anyway, uh, Laura, thanks to you, I think Greg got a New York sparkling that um, he's testing, and and that person and that person is also if he didn't get the EB one, he's getting EB two. So one some one of your neighbors is is, is going to uh, have one of our prototypes. Maybe he means engineering bill. Yeah, I connected Greg with Chris Misick of Belangelo Cellars and, and who is an incredible sparkling wine producer. And uh, yeah, so I'm really excited that he's the, the Finger Lake. doing the cross thing. So thank you for that. Oh, my, my, my pleasure. Um, so, so, so Greg, I, again, I can't, I can't thank you enough for um, spending this time. Hey, does everyone, did you all have fun? Did you all have a good time? We had a great time. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad. Again, it's so nice to see the, these um, incredible people who have been following Finger Lakes Wines and, uh, and me over these. And I can't wait for you to come. And, and Michelle, come too, please. And, um, and we'll take you to all these places. And, not, and again, you know better th as well as I do that the, it, the wine is wine, but the people behind the wine is what really makes it special. So Same is, uh, same is true here with Corbin. It's the people. And uh... I represent a team of incredible people, Michelle being one of the most incredible, um, and Katya I see here as well. Uh, we have an incredible team at Corvin, and you know, one of the things I think that unites us all is that we love this type of thing, um, the joy that wine brings to bring people together. Uh, these are fantastic wines, and I know Michelle is a New Yorker, I know I'm a New Yorker, uh, born in Manhattan. I'm not sure where Katya originally is from. Russia, so she was- Russia. She probably needs go. she needs the hookup with that uh, store. So this is uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, how many? I know someone's in Maryland, but who else is in the Finger Lakes? Is everybody close to Rochester? Everybody's a New Yorker. Cool. So when we come, uh, we'll see you there. And I think I think we need to have a blind tasting. Yeah, you know, I think we found the restaurant already. It's the Austrian oh. restaurant with the goulash. I'll be there yeah. in May. May 13th through the 17th is when I'm coming. I already have my tour booked and everything. So uh, we can have a little party when that we get there. Great. I, I definitely think that we should do a wine dinner at, at Dono's. Uh, again, it's a classic uh, Austrian. When we come? And um, what's yeah. that? When we come uh, in May, please? Well, it depends <laughs> on, I gotta do it when these guys can come, Dasha. So probably really won't be for, to I would love for us to be able to do something at uh, maybe harvest. Maybe we'll come for harvest and, and pick. Well, Dasha, yeah. you can come back. There's no question about it. We'll work that. it out. Well, we but can I come for harvest too. I'm just coming in May, but then we can come another we'll time. We'll have to come again. <laughs> so, Greg, I think we should do a blind tasting for them. Oh, I would love it. Are you kidding me? These are, these are all very difficult wines to preserve because they're, uh, except for the, the well, you know, actually, maybe the, the Separavi will be, but um, skin fermented natural wines were tough wines to preserve. Um, but argon and the needle that we use and, and the screw cap that we use now does does work well with them. And and then a high acid uh, fruit uh, driven wine with very low tannins, uh, Burgundy, um, for example, were very difficult to preserve. Uh, it took me 11 years to get it right. So uh, these are these are the right types of wines to be using um, for a blind tasting because they're tough. Uh, and I would love to see what this. Uh, I've never used Separavi as a as a blind tasting wines. So. <laughs> We don't have to. We've got to. We've got to get it into the list. We've done over a thousand blind tastings around the world. Um, so you know, with different types of wines from different types of regions, but never in Georgia, never with Separavi. We have used Black Frankish in Austria uh, with the Austrian producers. Kreutzler was the guy that I used. If you get a chance uh, to find a bottle, they're very expensive in the United States. They're cheap in Austria um, or in a, relatively inexpensive. Uh, Kreutzler, uh, Kreutzler, K R U T Z L E R. Um, is a delicious uh, Blau Frankish uh, producer. And, and this wine reminds me of that. And he is one of the best Blau Frankish producers. And that one of the best Blau Frankish producers and this wine are almost identical. Awesome. Uh, it's really amazing. Wow. Cool. Really kudos for, to well, the winemaker for that. Wine region to you now, Greg. You know, with you in Massachusetts, there it, it means that I think this will be one of many visits. Hopefully, I look forward to it. You're uh, close. 
Everybody, again, okay. thank you. It was so wonderful to see all of you again. I will let you know that April 1, I am launching some new virtuals, so keep an eye out for them. I am so excited about it. We will be, you'll be seeing some uh, sparkling wine coming across the table, as well as uh, uh, some new producers that you guys haven't seen before. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Kathy, I know you will be there. Dave, I know you guys. And um, again, thank you. I appreciate everything that you guys um, do in supporting our region. And thank you, Greg, Michelle, Ta and Katya for everything. Okay, that as well in making this day possible. See you Thursday. Bye. It was a lot of fun, guys. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, Laura. Thank you so much. All right. Thank ciao, ciao. Bye, all. Thanks, Laura. Take Thanks, care, Laura. Greg. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we got to leave.